Hello, welcome. I'm so pleased you're here for this video. I'm very excited about this one. This is a unique way, very unique way, of visualising how a two-stroke carburettor works. I've put two or three videos that I already have together and re-explain things to show an overall understanding. And this video, by the way, needs you to have very little or no prior knowledge of two-stroke carburettors in order for you to understand them. I hope you enjoy. Right, so I'm first going to take off the cap here and that'll expose the fuel pump diaphragm. So here is the diaphragm with the gasket. OK, now let's take a look at how all of this works. Fuel is sucked through the fuel inlet pipe where it's drawn down internally towards the carburettor body. And as it's drawn closer, the first thing it meets is this one-way valve flap which allows us a one-way passage through into the carburettor. So it's come up out of this hole and underneath this one-way valve flap, on its way through down into this hole. And it's been drawn this way by a suction pressure as it's pulled deeper down into the carburettor body, before being pulled through further through this hole on this vertical face. And it's this hole that spills out into this reservoir here. This is the fuel pump chamber and this is what's been drawing us in to this point. Here the fuel pump diaphragm sits above the chamber and operates as a pump. Each time the fuel pump diaphragm rose it created a suction pressure behind it and pulled in fuel underneath it. And as the diaphragm lowered it created a pushing pressure forcing the fuel this way. And any fuel wanting to come back this way is immediately stopped by that one way valve flap that we've just come through. So as the fuel pump diaphragm lowers and raises thousands of times a minute, it maintains that flow through the carburettor. And so that's why this is known as the fuel pump area and this is the fuel pump diaphragm. So as we know, the rising of the diaphragm draws the fuel underneath it towards an exit hole at the other side of the reservoir. And then it's the following downward motion of the diaphragm that pushes the fuel out through this fuel hole. Any damage or leaks in this diaphragm will cause engine problems such as bog down and starting issues. The diaphragm gets its movement energy from alternating crankcase pressures via a small air hole situated behind it. Connected to the engine's crankcase via the pulse line, it's the upward and downward motion of the piston that creates these pressures. Not to be mistaken from the engine's manifold which brings in a mixture of air and fuel from the carburettor. The area of the pulse line is usually situated beneath this and well below the piston. I've only illustrated it this way so we can see it's the piston doing the job. But as the piston rises it creates a suction pressure pulling inwards towards it and as it lowers again it creates a positive pushing pressure away from it. And so it's that pushing pressure that pushes the flexible diaphragm down. And when the piston rises and creates the suction pressure, that pulls the diaphragm back up. And that continues as the engine runs, so however many times the piston travels up and down is the same amount of times that the diaphragm will do the same. And this pumps the fuel through the exit and out through under the next one-way valve flap. Where the pump forces it through. This brings us out into another compartment between the carb body and the lid. The pressure of the incoming fuel fills this compartment and then it flows down through another fuel hole into the carburettor body. Down into this hole. This brings the fuel out into another compartment where again the pressure builds up before being forced through another fuel hole in the vertical face. And that hole comes out there. And that comes out into a compartment with a special metal screen filter. This one here. This flat metal filter is the last filtration the fuel goes through before being used in the engine. Any dirt or crud that managed to get past the fuel filter will hopefully now get separated here on the screen filter. Now let's take a look at what just happened. So fuel is drawn in from the fuel tank into the main inlet tube of the carburettor. It's then taken in through the fuel veins inside the carb body 
and up through the other fuel hole there. It then flows over into this hole. Then it's taken under through a little vein there again, before it floods out into this reservoir. Then it goes through under this fuel vein before it comes out of this fuel hole. Then down into this fuel hole, before going through another fuel vein, and then spills out through this hole into the strainer filter. So to sum it up, this is the route it's taken. Now passed through the strainer filter, the fuel goes down a tube to the bottom of the needle valve. And so the fuel's gone down there and it's come up to the bottom of this metering needle valve. And when it does so, when certain pressures in the metering chamber above are just right, it moves back and allows the fuel through. The needle valve can move up and down due to this pivoted metering lever. When pushed down at the back, it lifts up the needle. So when the needle's back, fuel floods into the metering chamber beneath the metering diaphragm. And this is the metering diaphragm that sits there on the top. And this area contacts the back of the metering lever to move it up and down, as we'll see in a moment. So all the time, the needle valve and the metering system has been regulating the amount of fuel that comes into this area. And how exactly has it been doing so? Well, let's now take a look at the metering system. So this sketch here is a side view of that. Fuel comes up to the bottom of the needle valve, and when it gets there, it can't go any further because the needle valve is fast on its seat, creating a seal. And the reason for that is because there's fuel already up here, in between the carburetor body and the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm here. This being the metering lever, it pivots like this. But because there's fuel here, it keeps the diaphragm up. So that little spring there allows the back to stay up and allows the front to stay down. That then pushes the needle valve onto its seat. And the reason there's lots of fuel up here is because the engine's either using very little or none at all. Here's what it does when it uses a lot of fuel. Let's say we've opened up the throttle, we've pressed the throttle trigger and it's needing lots of fuel. So fuel's going in to the engine. Now what's happened here is fuel's left this area. And when it leaves this area to go down into the engine, it creates a vacuum and pulls this diaphragm downwards. When it pulls it downwards, it pulls down the metering lever, pushes against that spring there, and that operates the lever that way. It lifts the needle off the seat and allows fuel to flow in. It's not really an all or nothing event. It's not not really either like that or like that all the time. It's more that the diaphragm is moving intermediately. It's right up if the machine's in the stationary position and not working, and it would be right down if it was full throttle, let's say. If the machine's working at a medium pace, then this diaphragm would be somewhere in a mediocre position, allowing so much fuel in. And so it was that that allowed this fuel to flow in to the metering chamber. And now that the fuel is here, that suction pressure from the main jet is drawing the fuel in. And on this carburetor, that's down there. Now flowing down towards the carburetor's venturi, it passes a small hole on the vertical face. And another stream of fuel is drawn in from this hole and added to the fuel that's already inside here. This is the fuel coming from the high, or the H, jet fuel hole. And the way this gets here is through this hole here at the top of the carburetor, near to the main jet hole. And on this carburetor, that's this little tiny hole right here. And so what happens is, in addition to the main jet hole, fuel is also drawn into this hole. And as it's drawn through, it enters a special fuel vein with this opening on its vertical face. Fuel doesn't flow in here, on the contrary, what we see is an appendage protruding outwards. This is indeed the very tip of the high jet adjustment screw. And of course, as we know, this screw can be screwed inwards, which makes the very tip of the fuel screw move out further into the fuel way. And if the screw is turned in until it comes to a stop, then this could be a complete block of the fuel going down this fuel tube. So screwing this screw back outwards will mean creating more of a gap in this tube, allowing more fuel to go through, until eventually this will reach a maximum. So whatever amount of fuel passes through, it travels down this fuel hole to meet the main fuel flow of the main jet.
And so here it is being drawn out of that fuel tube into the main fuel flow. And we can see it a little clearer like this. So the main jet and the correct running of the carburetor and the engine is sensitive to the amount of fuel coming out of this owl and it does rely on it. And as we've already seen, this fuel supplementation is adjustable by the fuel screw. The more the screw is screwed in, the less fuel comes out here. So the overall fuel amount available to the engine is less, or the fueling is leaner in other words. And the more the screw is screwed out, the more fuel comes out here. And therefore it's fueling richer. So with this screw, we can make the carburetor run rich or lean. And because at the moment we're talking about the H screw, meaning the high, so meaning high revs, then any adjustment on this screw will make the high revs of the engine rich or lean. And just to be a little clearer about that, let's look into this a little further, using my cross-sectional model of a two-stroke carburetor. As the operator pulsates on the throttle trigger, the throttle butterfly opens and closes periodically. But when open to its maximum, it allows a maximum flow rate of air through the carburetor to the engine, drawing out maximum fuel from the main jet. From this point where the engine's running well, turning the high screw anti-clockwise outwards, allowing more fuel out of the main jet, would mean there's too much fuel now going into the engine, and the engine's now struggling and would eventually stop. Essentially, the engine wasn't equipped to combust that amount of fuel, and it choked it. From the engine running well again, adjusting the H-screw inwards clockwise, reducing the amount of fuel coming from the main jet, means that the engine can combust the slight reduction of fuel much easier, so the engine revs a raise. But as the screw is screwed in further, and less fuel comes through, there isn't enough fuel there for combustion, and so engine revs reduce. Eventually, in most cases, the engine will stop. Just to clarify, this high level of revving, by the way, is usually considered as over-revving, and not generally thought of as actually a good thing. And that's because, as there's a reduced amount of fuel going into the engine, of course, with it being a two-stroke, there's also a reduced amount of lubricating oil. And so the engine running like this would have less lubrication, and over time could produce more wear. So it's much better to have an engine that's running more like this, so it's slightly richer in fuel, not too rich, so the engine doesn't run right, but it's slightly richer in order to have a better lubrication of the engine. And so it's the fine tuning of the rich and lean fueling is to the reason why this fuel is added in to the mainstream of fuel in this way. And they both head down together towards the induction tube or the venturi of the carburetor. And as they do, the air rushing through the venturi can be seen on its way into the engine as it passes the end of the main jet. And it's at this point that the fuel molecules in front of us can be seen joining the airflow. As it joins, it's instantly hit by the air and separated in what's known as atomized. And now it represents more of a mist than a fluid as it's pulled in through to combust in the engine. So the fuel has just gone down there, out here and through into the engine. But as well as the fuel being drawn down the main jet and the high jet, it's also drawn down this little hole here. This is the low jet hole. And on this particular carburetor, that's underneath where the meter and lever sits, a little tiny hole right here. Although existing for the fine tuning of idling speed, the suction pressure from the induction tube below draws a certain amount of fuel in through here all the time the engine is running, whether it's at idle or at high speed. Now when I say adjustment for the idling, I don't actually mean the idling adjustment screw, which sets the speed of idling. Instead, the low jet screw adjustment, which is what I'm talking about of course, sets the rich or lean fuel mixture when the engine is idling. And this will be better explained in just a moment or two. But when the fuel is drawn down into this hole, we see that once in there, its general principles are very much the same as the high jet fuel hole. Because very much like the high jet fuel screw, the low jet fuel screw also extends its tip right into the fuel way. And of course, just like the high jet screw, the more the low jet screw is turned inwards, the more its tip protrudes out into the fuel way. And the more this happens, the more it blocks off the fuel. And the more it's screwed outwards, the more it retracts out of the fuel way, thus allowing more fuel to pass through. <laughs> 
And so when the fuel screw is set correctly and the desired amount of fuel is allowed to pass through, it travels down the fuelway into a special compartment. So if we look at it from being inside this compartment and at the moment it's empty, we can see the fuel now flowing in. And so it fills this area, but what area are we actually talking about? Where is this? Well, right next to the low jet fuel hole, there is a core plug or a Welsh plug. And underneath that Welsh plug is this compartment that's just been filled. And having a look on this carburetor that's had the core plug removed, the fuel has gone down the low jet fuel hole, through the fuel way, out through the small hole in this corner where it comes in and floods the compartment. And so with the core plug in place, this compartment underneath is constantly being filled as the carburetor runs. And it's the suction pressure of the induction tube which draws that fuel out of that compartment to be used in the engine on idling revs. And as I've previously mentioned, even though some of this fuel comes out of here, whether it's idling speed or maximum revs, it's the idling speed that's sensitive to the fuel flow from these three holes. And if we take this torch and shine through these little holes and have a look in the induction tube, you can clearly see that all three have a direct route to there. And depending on the position of the low jet screw will depend on how much fuel is allowed to flow into this compartment to be used down in the induction tube below at idling speed. So this is why the idling speed is sensitive to the amount of fuel coming out of these three holes. Because at idling speed when there's less suction pressure going in through the induction tube, it's easier to draw the fuel out of these three holes than it is the main jet. Because the main jet has a valving system. But for this carburetor, at idling speed, the fuel is drawn out of these three holes easily. And the amount that it's allowed to have at any particular time depends on the positioning of the low jet screw. If it's screwed in, there's less allowed to come out of there, so the idling speed is going to be more lean. And the more the screw is screwed out, the more fuel is allowed to flood in and be available for idling speed. And that will make it much richer. And so now we've had a look at how the rich and lean adjustments of idling works, let's now have a look at adjusting idling speed itself, using of course the idling adjustment screw. Adjusting the idling screw in here clockwise mechanically pushes on to the lever of the throttle butterfly. And the more it screws in pushing it back, the more the butterfly opens allowing more air into the carburetor, which pulls out more of that fuel out of the main jet and as a result engine revs raise. This speed would be too fast for the chainsaw to idle because the chain would be moving. So to adjust it of course, we turn the screw backwards again, anti-clockwise. And that closes up the throttle butterfly, reducing the amount of air coming into the carburetor and the engine revs lower again. So getting an happy medium with the idling speed is a must. Not too high that the chain is turning and not too low. An ideal midpoint. And at that I want to thank you for watching this video, which I hope you found interesting and educational. And if you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe and I'll be back soon. Thank you for watching.